what we saw here was that we should expect that uncertainty outcome kind of goes down when we introduce these three one zero system. We kind of measure this on a single match, okay? But now we can adopt the measure we constructed in the previous chapter. We look at leagues, okay? So I have kind of taken up a paper here. Uh, it's not in the textbook, I think, where I looked at these. Uh, if you remember these row L, these uh, competitive measurements of ours from chapter two, I think it was. Uh, and we should expect then that this row should kind of have a sharp shift downwards after the introduction of the three one zero system. And here you see the development of this row L for Premier League all the way back from 1947 up until 2004. And if you see, it's perhaps not so easy to see this, but here is the 210 system, and here was the introduction of the 310 system in yeah, around 1981, it seems, maybe 82. And uh, you see, in the old days, it was kind of to some extent up here, but then going down. You see, these stapled lines here kind of ref reflects the average of the numbers. So you see here a, a relatively obvious change here in competitiveness in Premier League after this introduction of the 3-1-0 system. More or less as should be expected. So we can we kind of use game theory to, to predict something and then we look at what really happened. If you look at other leagues, here is uh, Norway. And you see Norway was later to adopt the 3-1-0 system than Premier League. This was in 86, I think. It also said there was a med medium season in 87 here, where there was a 3 2 one zero system, like in they have in ice hockey now, which was kind of, of course, a, a bad mistake then, due to the fact that everybody played more defensively with that system. But you also see the same pattern here, that uh, the average before the system changed was kind of up here, then it moved down here after the introduction. Of course, there is changes here up and down, but the averages are significantly different, as we say, when we do statistics. Do you know any statistics? you know what significantly, significantly different means? It means basically that it's so much different that it could not be at random. Okay. So it, it's kind of some kind of proof of, of reasonably big enough difference. Here's Romania. 81 to 99, they, they, were, they were even later adopting the system, you can see, back in 94. So you see, there was a long time period here where there were kind of different systems running through different count countries. Again, the same thing is shown here. Staple line, 2-1 system, then down on the 3-1 system. So we kind of see these uh, effects on reality of doing this change. The ideal would, of course, have been to been able to construct a change here, which did not affect competitive balance, but also had the effect that teams scored more goals, given that most spectators liked that more. Okay. The problem in the late 70s was, of course, that it almost wasn't scored any goals. Almost every game ended in a draw, and of course, then it becomes boring for those who are not real interested. And. Uh, that's perhaps the end of this story. Yeah. Anything else to watch here? Apart from a lot of mathematics? No. You see, when you publish this stuff internationally, you have to be a bit more precise on... on uh, let me see, is the chicken case here? On... Uh, doing things. There's even a proof here and there is some more proofs and a lot of equations. Okay, so so uh, as you can understand the version in the textbook is kind of a very simplified version of this one. Okay, you don't have access to this one anyway, so it doesn't really matter. The next point the next question I told you I would attack is the concept of DOS indeed. Can we be certain that 
going from a 2-1 system to a 3-1 system gives more offensive play. In order to judge that, we have to be much more precise on what we mean by offensive and defensive play. Okay, because we haven't been precise on that yet. Defensive play is normally in our head, perhaps circling around something like this. If we don't try to get the goal, but try to avoid the opponent to put a goal on us, then we play defensively. Okay? But this is kind of a definition which is perhaps hard to transform into the way we look at a football match now with this table of probabilities. So we perhaps will have to look at these probabilities and try to put content in them, especially how they relate to each other. And that's what we have to do now. But in order to be able to do this, we have to make some simplifications. And the simplification we make here, which is a type of simplification we very often actually do in game theory, is that we look at teams that are equally good. So instead of looking at any kind of team, we kind of restrict ourselves to the set of teams which we know don't exist, because there are not two equally good teams. They cannot exist by definition, so we look at a kind of theoretical situation where we assume that the teams are clones of each other. And we achieve that by the numbers in the table over there. If you look at them, you can see here that if both these two equally teams choose the same strategy, no, they are equal, of course, they should have the same probability of beating each other. Do you, do you agree? That seems reasonable. Okay? Then they are equal. Of course, the same down here, if they choose the defensive strategy, then they should also have the equal probability. So what happens if they choose different strategies? Now, if uh, a clone team it could be that a certain team is better to play defensively than offensively, or vice versa. You agree? Okay, that, that's, that's possible. So we cannot see that they, they have to have the same probability here. That's not given. But what we, what we must say is that, is that if one of the team chooses D and the other O, and we have a set of probabilities for they beating each other, then we have to swap or flip that if they change strategy. You agree? Because they are the same teams. So these numbers here, their structure defines the fact that we are looking at two equal teams. Okay? So that limits situation. You see, this one will have to be equal to that one, that one will have to be equal to that one, and that one must be equal to that one, and that one must be equal to that one. That is the kind of constraint that we will put on the number of teams we look at here, and defines the teams as equally good or clones. Okay, did you understand this? So, let's try to write this up a little bit here. Ah. Well, let's take out this. So, equal strategy PIJ should equal PJI. That's uh, mathematically meaning that if they choose the, the same one here and here, they, this one should equal that one. The same down here. There are different strategy. I just draw it swapping, okay? Meaning that if we have P12, P21 on one line and we swap strategies, then we have to put P1, P21 in the place of P12 and vice versa. Just as we have done here, okay? So turn this around, move it one down. <coughs> Let's start discussing 
what do we mean by offensive versus defensive strategies okay so now we'll try to look into these probabilities and see what kind of constraints you have to put on them given that you choose an offensive or a defensive strategy now let's look at this one P D D D now this means this is the probability that the match ends in a draw given that both teams choose a defensive strategy okay and let's compare that one to this one P D O O and what's interesting is whether we can put something here like this or like this or like this okay that's what we're aiming for I would say that it's straightforward to accept that the inequality should be like this so if both teams try to play defensively there will not be much goals and the game would be the high uncertain high uh, likelihood and in a draw if they on the other hand try to attack of course it still could end in a draw but it's obviously more probable that one of the teams win so this is one way of interpreting the difference between offensive and defensive play, isn't it? You can probably discuss this as well, okay? But in, in, uh, at large, I would say that this seems reasonable. Now let's look at the numbers here. Do we have this situation? P, D, 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 that is this one, isn't it? It's 0 0.30. It's bigger than 0 0.24, so in this case, this is correct. Okay, so the numbers we have in the table they correspond to this. No. Let's do a little bit of calculations here. Okay. Now we have that. P, D, 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 which is this probability, and if we now add these other probabilities, P, 1, 2, D, D, plus P, 2, 1, D, D, they should all equal 1, shouldn't they? They kind of span every possibility here. Discussed that in a previous lecture. And this would also hold for this one, wouldn't it? It will actually hold for any of the lines, but especially it will hold for these two lines. The reason why I pick up these two is that we know something about this probability and this probability, don't we? They are equal, based on our assumption of equal teams. And so here we can actually utilize that to simplify our arguments. So these two are equal as well as these two. So let's just pick one of them. Uh, we can say that, uh, yeah, we can say that in this case P21DD equals P12DD, of course. And then we can take this equation and rewrite it, can't we? We can write it as PDDD equals 1 minus that 1 plus the same one, which is 2P12. D. You agree? So I utilize this fact, so I put this one on the place of that one, we can add them together, it becomes two of them, we move it on that side, then we get 1 minus 2 P1 DD. Of course the same holds for P2 
PDOO as 1 minus 2 P12 O O. Okay? Same argument. <coughs> now when we have this one and we have rep representations of oh, this one as that expression, that one as that expression, we can substitute that one in for that one and that one in for this one. Okay, and then we can derive expressions for these other probabilities here. <coughs> so this means that one then leads to that we can put in this one for PDD 1 minus 2 P1 2 DD which should be uh, sorry, a shorter arrow here perhaps Then we are put in for that one, that expression, and that one in for the other one. It's 1 minus 2 P1 2 O O. Are you following me? It is getting complicated. Okay, this one is the same, vanishes. Moving that one on that side, that one on that side, we change signs, and 2 can be then be reduced so this ends with p one two o oh, oh, bigger than p one two d d and now we have been able based on this assumption to deduce another constraint on our probabilities so the probability that team one should be team two given both offensive strategies should be larger than the probability that team 1 beats team 2, given both choose defensive strategies. So is this then replicated in the numbers? P1200, that is that one, isn't it? 0 0.38. P12DD, that is that one, 0 0.35. 0 0.38 is bigger than 0 0.35. So that is also in correspondence. So, another argument. Now remember, this is the only argument we have made. We cannot start it out. This must be the case, okay? And then we were able to derive that one through pure logic, okay? So this is given that this is correct, this must be correct. But now we will make a new assumption, okay? What about P D O D compared to P D D? Again, we're looking at the draw prob probabilities, and the question now is whether. Again, in my opinion, it's reasonable that it must be like this. Again, if both plays defensively, nothing happens. There's a big probability of a draw. In this case, one of the teams plays offensively. Then you would perhaps accept that the draw oh, should be this way. Sorry. Let me do it right. We have to keep our tongue straight here. Okay. P D D D should be bigger than P D O D. That was my point. So there's a bigger tendency to draw matches if both teams play defensively than if only one team plays offensively. It's kind of the same argument as we started out with here if both teams teams play defensively and if both teams play offensively you would expect more draws if both teams play defensively so this is kind of our 
second assumption, if you like, or belief of what the meaning of defensive versus offensive play really means, and you co convert it into probabilities. So what about our numbers? Do they have this ability, P, D, D, D? The draw probability of a DD is 0 0.30. And that's bigger than both these two numbers, isn't it? Of course, they are always the same. PDO equals POD here due to the swapping structure. So this number is bigger than these two numbers. That's exactly what we have claimed on the board here. So. What about this, comparing these two, finally? What about these two? P, D, O, D versus P, D, O, O. We haven't kind of compared these yet. So here, there is a strategic choice where they kind of separate. One team plays offensively, the other plays defensively. Of course, again, there will be some draws here. The question is, will it be more or less draws in a situation where both play offensively? That's not so easy to say, is it? Perhaps we would expect that if one team plays defensively, they kind of defend good, but of course they don't have to depends somewhat on, on, but in this case, of course, the teams are equally good. So we would perhaps expect that P, D, O, D, slightly more draws in this case than in this case. Although it's not as obvious here, in my opinion, as it was in the two other cases. And if you look at the numbers here, uh, P, D, O, O is 0 0.24. P, D, O, D is 0 0.19. So it is actually mm, P, D, O, D. P, D, O, D is 0 0.19, isn't it? Yeah. And C P, D, O, O is 0 0.24. So here we don't have that in the numbers. Do you see that? We don't have this inequality in those numbers. Okay, the next step now is to look at the Nash Equilibrium. Now there will be two games, one game in the 3 one zero system, another game in the 2 one zero system, and to some surprise, let's see what happens here. And we have to move a little bit down here, and here is the result. Now if you look at the numbers, of course you can imagine that I have been doing a lot of experiments to get the right numbers here. And of course I did that. But if you look on the left here, you see that uh, 1 is bigger than 0 0.99. That's the best reply here. 101 is bigger than 1.0. You see again, it's very close here. 1.0 is bigger than 0 0.99 and 1.01 is bigger than 1. So we end up in the 2 one system with an equilibrium where both players chooses the offensive strategy. When we change the numbers, substituting 2 for win with 3, this is the result. You see here, 139 is bigger than 138, 139 is bigger than 138, 142 is bigger than 135, and 142 is bigger than 135. So we suddenly get a chicken type of game here with two Nash equilibria. But what's interesting here is that both of these Nash equilibria they contain a defensive strategy. Okay. So, this seems that we cannot guarantee that there will be more offensive play when you move from a 2-1 system to a 3-1 system, because in this case it will actually be more defensive play. Although we don't know who plays defensively, but the Nash Equilibra tells us that one of the players will choose a defensive strategy under the 3-1 system, while none will choose a defensive strategy 
under the two one system. But, and that is important, this constraint was not imposed. If we impose this constraint on our numbers, then we can show that it will always end up in more offensive play, either the same or more. So the only reason why we got this curious result was due to the lack of this constraint. But again, it's not obvious that this one should be in this direction. We can also argue that it could be in the other direction. As opposed to these other two cases where I kind of find it obvious that uh, the inequality sign should be in that direction. So we, we are kind of balancing on some kind of sharp edge here. Of course, this is a special case. And it does by all means not show that the normal case is like this. This is a very peculiar case. But it tells us that as long as we can find a peculiar case, it could be that in a certain league, in a certain special country, this may be what happens. And then, of course, by putting on this changed point score rule, you can actually end up with less offensive play. Combining that with reduced uncertainty outcome is, of course, a bad thing. Okay? Especially if the idea is that you want to have more offensive play. To some extent, this shows the complexity of game theory. Okay? It's not obvious what happens. Sometimes it's counterintuitive. Uh, but it also tells you the complexity of reality. Because this is an extremely simplified version of reality. Reality is much more complex than this. So if you look really into reality, we should always, always or almost expect any kind of crazy, crazy thing to happen. And again, that secures my argument that if we have something that works, if we want to change it, then we should be fairly certain that the change has the effects we believe it should have. And the only way of analyzing that really is to go through very extensive and far more complex game theory than this. Probably at the level that it's really impossible to do it. And then, of course, you boils down to the situation you ha have today. So in the Norwegian Football Association chooses a voice strategy by hiring a Dutch company to tell them what to do. Okay? Because if they get everybody against them, then saying we don't want this, then they go back. Oh, we don't want you, Dutchman. Go back. Okay? On the other hand, they can adopt it. This is a very nice but very simple strategy. Okay? This has been very popular among Norwegian politicians, haven't it? Instead of making decisions themselves, they introduce these, what do you call it, these agencies, these health, Midt-Norge and so on, to make the decisions. Okay? So they will have to take the unpopular decision on where the hospital should lie. But of course the politicians are silly, they will not get away with it. Okay? Even though if a decision is made, it will always fall back on the politicians. So the, the, this is a far too simple strategy. OK, that kind of ends the main points in chapter 4. Maybe the toughest chapter so far. Uh, do we have any questions? Of course, you will see the kind of level I will test you on an exam, and we kind of move into the exercises here. And, uh, and uh, normally, it's not uh, very difficult. So, I so don't be frightened by this if, if you kind of feel that I didn't get every point here. It's kind of normal. Okay, but you need to study it and look into it and uh, think a little bit about this. Okay. No questions. Either that means that everybody understood everything or nobody understood everything. Okay. I'm not sure what to, what to pick today. But, uh, in any case, it's your responsibility. OK. Then we skip chapter 5 and move directly into chapter 6. Chapter 5 is not a part. It contains something you definitely don't know what is. Taylor series expansions. And so you will uh, 
and uh, some RB charge arguments and certain stuff which is uh, way below the level in this group of students. Okay. What is a myth? Myte in Norwegian. You know what a myth is? It is something that has been told so many times that everybody believes it is true even though it's false. That's a myth. Okay. Have you heard about somebody at the internet who are called Mythbusters? Have you seen these videos? Okay, they kind of pick some truth which everybody believes is the truth and it, it, they show that it's not the truth. Okay. So the question is, uh, when does these myths kind of show up? What, what's kind of forcing myths to, to take? action or be myths. Uh, in general I believe that there is a simple answer to that question and if you kind of enter into complex areas then there is a tendency that these myths kind of arise. So if you enter into an area which is hard to understand, hard to explain, hard to model through mathematics for instance, then these myths come up. A classic example is religion, of course, where, where nobody understands anything. And of course, then all these myths come up about angels and walking on water and whatever, okay? Virgin births and all this stuff. I hope I don't if offend anybody here. If there is strictly religious people, you're free to argue against me. But of course, as we have argued in this course, football is complex. Okay, so you would expect myths to come up. And myths are kind of like uh, general rules, okay? You should always do this, you should never do that. And already at this point, we should start being suspicious, shouldn't we? If you tell a penalty kick taker, taker that he should always aim his penalty in the middle, do you think that's a good strategy? Oh, that's the pos worst possible one, isn't it? Because uh, at the moment, uh, opposing teams have observed this penalty kick taker always shooting in the middle, then the keeper will always save his shots. Okay? So that's not a good thing. So we know that in games, at least in certain games, there are situations where your ability to be unpredictable is important. And in most situations in football, actually, this element of unpredictability is important. In Norway, we have this, or we had this sports commentator called Arne Scheie. Have you heard about him? Jenka, you have probably not heard about Arne Scheie, but I assume the rest of you have heard about him. Very familiar with the character. He was in the old days uh, commenting a lot of football, but uh, due to some changes in licensing, he had to move from football into ski jumping, which has been his kind of uh, major commentating arena the last 15 or 20 years, I would say. But before that, b before you were born, maybe, he was kind of the main commentator for football in NRK. But of course, then in those days, NRK had matches. You have to have matches to have commentators. Okay, today it's other channels who have these matches, and it's only in World Championships and European Championships that Arne has kind of moved into place as a football commentator. But the nice thing about Arne is that he has kind of he is reflecting these myths. Okay, and he has this one which I call the Arne Shea myth, which says that on all corner kicks, the defending team should always have two men on the corner posts. Do you understand what I mean now? He's, he has been obsessively into this. Okay, here is the goal. There is a corner. Somebody is kicking the ball here, and then there should be a person here and a person here, covering up this area, of course, to avoid that the opponent either heads or shoot there. Of course, to some extent, that seems reasonable. But we don't see this all the time, do we? I don't know whether you have studied the local team or other teams on the corner behavior. But if you study in modern football teams, you don't see these tends to always do these kind of things. Sometimes there are people on the post, sometimes there are not. So it could not be obviously favorable then to do this, could it? What What is the kind of problem with doing it? What is the drawback? They could do that, yes. That is one problem. But I think about another problem here, mainly. There is something about the opposing team. They are not standing here. No, they are standing out here, aren't they? Here are the opposers. And of course, the other defenders are around here. But there will be more of these now, wouldn't it? Compared to those when these are here. So there are less people to kind of cover up and uh, 
do strategic work in the field. So you could perhaps say that in situations where the opposing team is not very good at corners, maybe you could draw them out to try to win the ball faster, perhaps that is one way to think. On the other hand, if the opposing team knows that you always have, always have two players here, then they also know that they are in majority, don't they? And that opens up for building a strategy. So you see here, <coughs> these myths telling you that you should always do this or never do that is always questionable in football. The most famous one of them all, of course, the, the classical one, never change a winning team. It's more like the same, isn't it? Because if you always play with the same team, your opponent will observe that and can and that opens up a rich strategic space for the opponent. So changing the team slightly from time to time could definitely be a good thing to do, even though you weaken the team slightly, because it makes problems for your opponent to build stable attacking as well as defensive tactics. And of course, if you look empirically into the world and look at teams, as is discussed in the textbook here, for instance, the Norwegian national team under uh, Egil Olsen, you will see that he used an enormous amount of players. Mm. Yeah, there is some examples here on this. Here, of course, is a national equilibrium in, in, in uh, mixed strategies, and that's kind of what we talk about here. The, the need for mixed strategies in many situations. Yeah, there is some calculations here. Don't bother with them. It's just uh, uh, one way of looking at the amount of possible teams to pick. Of course, when you're a national coach, you can actually pick from many players, can't you? There is many teams, many players to pick from. And it's kind of a much more challenging job to be a national team manager when it comes to picking the team than being a club manager, where you only have 30 or 20 or 30 players to pick from. But still, there is a fair amount of teams to build. And that is kind of what we do here by looking at some combinatorics. So you see here in, in, uh, in a 20-team squad, OK? Then you can calculate the number of possible teams to pick by taking 20 faculty. You know, do you know the term faculty? Have you seen that before? Do you know the meaning of this? It means 1 times 2 times 3, OK? So a faculty is you multiply up to that number. So even though you probably don't know it, it turns out that if you are to pick 11 men out of a squad of 20, then you can compute that by taking 20 faculty over 11 faculty times 9 faculty. This 11 comes from that one, and that one comes from that minus that one. So there's a general rule here, OK? And that turns out to be 167,960 teams, OK? possible different teams. So that's quite a big amount, isn't it? Of course, in practice, it wouldn't be that hard because there is typically a certain amount of keepers. And in this situation, of course, the keeper could be a striker and a midfielder. Okay, The keepers normally stay here. And these defenders, they stay in defense. And the midfielders, they could either play there or there, perhaps. The attackers could perhaps play there and there. So it's, it's, more, it's less than this Okay, when you are to pick a sport. Of course, if you have like more than 30, 30 man squad, then of course it's uh, this number becomes much bigger, doesn't it? You have to substitute these by 30, these by 11, and these by 30 minus 11, which is 21. Okay, so it becomes a big, bigger number. Of course, most teams today at the top level will have big squads. Okay, in Premier League they may have squads of 30, 40, and 50 players. But the point here is that. If you look uh, at the example of Norway under Drilo Olsen, it says that during 88 matches, the Norwegian and Egil Olsen used 81 players. Okay. On average, this means that they roughly changed one player in every game. Okay, uh, that's you'll have to do that to kind of use up 81. Uh, at least if it had been 88 players, then it would be like that exactly. So again, you can say these always and never choices are dangerous. Okay, Always be careful about that. They are, in general, normally not correct. Most cases, it should be unpredictability. Okay, that is kind of what gains you, and of course what gains your opponent to a certain extent in equilibrium here. But uh, that's, uh, in almost any case, a better strategy. 
at least when we think about gameplay, okay, how to take a throw in and how to position yourself in a free kick and that kind of stuff. Being predictable there is dangerous, obviously. There is all these sayings, isn't it, that the keeper should never be on half distance, okay? Have you heard that? That's a classical one, okay? If there is, there's another one, if there is a match between a defender and a striker on the ball, the keeper should never go out and try to get the ball. Because the reason is, of course, that if he doesn't miss it, then the goal is open. On the other hand, if he catches the ball, then it's good, isn't it? So again, you can see these rules, they are uh, normally not correct. Um, so be careful about these football myths, okay? In general, they are not right. So if you hear anybody s using the words always or never when you talk about football, you should think about this lesson, okay? There is almost never al al always or never who is the correct answer. Some tiny cases it could be. And of course, then the game theory kind of gives a pure Nash equilibrium. Okay, then you should always write in, uh, put your penalty kick in the in the. As I said, if if you are so good that you can put the ball with enough force up here, then you always do that. Okay, and that then always is correct. But in most cases, penalty kick executors are not that good. I have not seen anybody that good. Have you? Is anybody of you able to for any keeper here to put the ball? With necessary force in that position? If you are, I'd like to see it, okay? I, I'll give you some money, okay? Maybe you should start practicing. Okay, that ends this course. So we are kind of finished now. Isn't more to say. The idea was to give you some simple introduction to game theory and then show you some applications into football and what we can use it for and hopefully give you some insight in the complexity of this game from a different angle of attack uh, as you normally do when you watch the match and in some cases it may, it may even be useful because it may be a tool that is could be interesting for coaches for instance to analyze stuff of course the problem with it is that it very easily becomes very difficult we kind of kept it at a level where it, it's we are able to handle it mathematically, but when we increase it slightly, it becomes very fast, very difficult. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. Okay, are anybody of you following the chess world championships now? No. Well, if you're interested in game theory, chess is almost as good as football, but only almost. Okay. So spend a little time watching. Maybe a good idea. Now it's all about what do you think that he thinks that you think that uh, it's all about that, isn't it? That's what it's all about in game theory. That's a very hard thing to grasp in our mind. We are uh, human beings are good at processing information like in memory, like in combination, but thinking many steps ahead, predicting reactions, we are not good at. So my belief is that the next version of human beings which will come at some point when a new kind of uh, what do you call it mutation comes up will have that ability maybe in 100 million years who knows depends on whether the sun has fallen before that then this new breed of human beings will come and they will be able to understand tactics and strategy much better than we can some people say that much of the reasons why we have these problems on Earth with war and violence, rape, whatever, is due to the fact that our ability to look through and plan and kind of see what might happen here is not good enough. Because if we had been able to foresee and predict what our opponents do, maybe we didn't fire the first shot or hit the first blow. Who knows? Okay. Okay. Questions? Comments, suggestions for improvement. If not, we meet tomorrow at 9.15 and then we start the boring work on looking at the exercises. Okay. okay. Thank you. You have been nice students.
very silent. <laughs> You haven't been that silent. It's, uh... <laughs>